The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued. Cassette 8, Side 1. There was not much art in this architecture, so far as we can vision it now. It was a mass of straight lines seeking the glory of size. Here and there among the ruins are vaults and arches, forms derived from Sumeria, negligently used and unconscious of their destiny. Decoration, interior and exterior, was almost confined to enameling some of the brick surfaces with bright glazes of yellow, blue, white, and red, with occasional tiled figures of animals or plants. The use of vitrified glaze, not merely to beautify but to protect the masonry from sun and rain, was at least as old as Naram Sin and was to continue in Mesopotamia down to Moslem days. In this way, ceramics, though seldom producing rememberable pottery, became the most characteristic art of the ancient Near East. Despite such aid, Babylonian architecture remained a heavy and prosaic thing, condemned to mediocrity by the material it used. The temples rose rapidly out of the earth, which slave labor turned so readily into brick and cementing pitch. They did not require centuries for their erection, like the monumental structures of Egypt or medieval Europe, but they decayed almost as quickly as they rose. Fifty years of neglect reduced them to the dust from which they had been made. The very cheapness of brick corrupted Babylonian design. With such materials it was easy to achieve size, difficult to compass beauty. Brick does not lend itself to sublimity, and sublimity is the soul of architecture. 8. Babylonian Science Mathematics, Astronomy, the Calendar, Geography, Medicine Being merchants, the Babylonians were more likely to achieve successes in science than in art. Commerce created mathematics and united with religion to beget astronomy. In their varied functions as judges, administrators, agricultural and industrial magnates, and soothsayers skilled in examining entrails and stars, the priests of Mesopotamia unconsciously laid the foundations of those sciences which, in the profane hands of the Greeks, were for a time to depose religion from its leadership of the world. Babylonian mathematics rested on a division of the circle into 360 degrees and of the year into 360 days. On this basis, it developed a sexagesimal system of calculation by sixties, which became the parent of later duodecimal systems of reckoning by twelves. The numeration used only three figures, assigned for one, repeated up to nine, assigned for ten, repeated up to ninety, and assigned for one hundred. Computation was made easier by tables, which showed not only multiplication and division, but the halves, quarters, thirds, squares, and cubes of the basic numbers. Geometry advanced to the measurement of complex and irregular areas. The Babylonian figure for pi, the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of a circle, was three, a very crude approximation for a nation of astronomers. Astronomy was the special science of the Babylonians, for which they were famous throughout the ancient world. Here again magic was the mother of science. The Babylonians studied the stars not so much to chart the courses of caravans and ships as to divine the future fates of men. They were astrologers first and astronomers afterward. Every planet was a god interested and vital in the affairs of men. Jupiter was Marduk, Mercury was Nabu, Mars was Nergal, the sun was Shamash, the moon was Sin, Saturn was Ninib, Venus was Ishtar. Every movement of every star determined or forecast some terrestrial event. If, for example, the moon was low, a distant nation would submit to the king. If the moon was in crescent, the king would overcome the enemy. Such efforts to wring the future out of the stars became a passion with the Babylonians. Priests skilled in astrology reaped rich rewards from both people and king. Some of them were sincere students, poring zealously over astrologic tomes which, according to their traditions, had been composed in the days of Sargon of Akkad. They complained of the quacks who, without such study, went about reading horoscopes for a fee or predicting the weather a year ahead in the fashion of our modern almanacs. Astronomy developed slowly out of this astrologic observation and charting of the stars, as far back as 2000 B.C., the Babylonians had made accurate records of the heliacal rising and setting of the planet Venus. They had fixed the position of various stars and were slowly mapping the sky. The Kassite conquest interrupted this development for a thousand years. Then, under Nebuchadrezzar, astronomic progress was resumed. 
The priest scientists plotted the orbits of sun and moon, noted their conjunctions and eclipses, calculated the courses of the planets, and made the first clear distinction between a planet and a star. To the Babylonians, a planet was distinguished from the fixed stars by its observable motion or wandering. In modern astronomy, a planet is defined as a heavenly body regularly revolving about the sun. They determined the dates of winter and summer solstices, of vernal and autumnal equinoxes, and, following the lead of the Sumerians, divided the ecliptic, that is, the path of the earth around the sun, into the twelve signs of the zodiac. Having divided the circle into 360 degrees, they divided the degree into 60 minutes, and the minute into 60 seconds. They measured time by a clepsydra, or water clock, and a sundial, and these seemed to have been not merely developed, but invented by them. They divided the year into twelve lunar months, six having thirty days, six twenty-nine. And as this made but three hundred fifty-four days in all, they added a thirteenth month occasionally to harmonize the calendar with the seasons. The month was divided into four weeks according to the four phases of the moon. An attempt was made to establish a more convenient calendar by dividing the month into six weeks of five days, but the phases of the moon proved more effective than the conveniences of men. The day was reckoned not from midnight to midnight, but from one rising of the moon to the next. It was divided into twelve hours, and each of these hours was divided into thirty minutes, so that the Babylonian minute had the feminine quality of being four times as long as its name might suggest. The division of our month into four weeks, of our clock into twelve hours instead of twenty-four, and of our hour into sixty minutes, and of our minute into sixty seconds, are unsuspected Babylonian vestiges in our contemporary world. From charting the skies, the Babylonians turned to mapping the earth. The oldest maps of which we have any knowledge were those which the priests prepared of the roads and cities of Nebuchadrezzar's empire. A clay tablet found in the ruins of Gasur, 200 miles north of Babylon, and dated back to 1600 B.C., contains, in a space hardly an inch square, a map of the province of Shatazala. It represents mountains by rounded lines, water by tilting lines, rivers by parallel lines. The names of various towns are inscribed, and the direction of north and south is indicated in the margin. The dependence of Babylonian science upon religion had a more stagnant effect in medicine than in astronomy. It was not so much the obscurantism of the priests that held the science back as the superstition of the people. Already by the time of Hammurabi, the art of healing had separated itself in some measure from the domain and domination of the clergy— a regular profession of physician had been established with fees and penalties fixed by law. A patient who called in a doctor could know in advance just how much he would have to pay for such treatment or operation, and if he belonged to the poorer classes, the fee was lowered accordingly. If the doctor bungled badly, he had to pay damages to the patient. In extreme cases, as we have seen, his fingers were cut off so that he might not readily experiment again. But this almost secularized science found itself helpless before the demand of the people for supernatural diagnosis and magical cures. Sorcerers and necromancers were more popular than physicians, and enforced by their influence with the populace irrational methods of treatment. Disease was possession, and was due to sin. Therefore it had to be treated mainly by incantations, magic, and prayer. When drugs were used, they were aimed not to cleanse the patient but to terrify and exorcise the demon. The favorite drug was a mixture deliberately compounded of disgusting elements, apparently on the theory that the sick man had a stronger stomach than the demon that possessed him. The usual ingredients were raw meat, snake flesh, and wood shavings mixed with wine and oil, or rotten food, crushed bones, fat, and dirt mingled with animal or human urine or excrement. Occasionally this drekapotek was replaced by an effort to appease the demon with milk, honey, cream, and sweet-smelling herbs. If all treatment failed, the patient was in some cases carried into the marketplace so that his neighbors might indulge their ancient propensity for prescribing infallible cures. Perhaps the 800 medical tablets that survive to inform us of Babylonian medicine do it injustice. Reconstruction of the whole from a part is hazardous in history, and the writing of history is the reconstruction of the whole from a part. Quite possibly these magical cures were merely subtle uses of the power of suggestion. Perhaps those evil concoctions were intended as emetics, and the Babylonian may have meant nothing more irrational by his theory of illness as due to invading demons and the patient's sins 
than we do by interpreting it as due to invading bacteria invited by culpable negligence, uncleanliness, or greed. We must not be too sure of the ignorance of our ancestors. 9. Philosophers Religion and Philosophy, the Babylonian Job, the Babylonian Koheleth, and Anticlerical. A nation is born Stoic and dies Epicurean. At its cradle, to repeat a thoughtful adage, religion stands, and philosophy accompanies it to the grave. In the beginning of all cultures, a strong religious faith conceals and softens the nature of things, and gives men courage to bear pain and hardship patiently. At every step the gods are with them, and will not let them perish until they do. Even then a firm faith will explain that it was the sins of the people that turned their gods to an avenging wrath. Evil does not destroy faith, but strengthens it. If victory comes, if war is forgotten in security and peace, then wealth grows. The life of the body gives way in the dominant classes to the life of the senses and the mind. Toil and suffering are replaced by pleasure and ease. Science weakens faith even while thought and comfort weaken virility and fortitude. At last men begin to doubt the gods, they mourn the tragedy of knowledge, and seek refuge in every passing delight. Achilles is at the beginning, Epicurus at the end. After David comes Job, and after Job Ecclesiastes. Since we know the thought of Babylon mostly from the later reigns, it is natural that we should find it shot through with the weary wisdom of tired philosophers who took their pleasures like Englishmen. On one tablet, Balta Atrua complains that, though he has obeyed the commands of the gods more strictly than anyone else, he has been laid low with a variety of misfortunes. He has lost his parents and his property, and even the little that remained to him has been stolen on the highway. His friends, like Job's, reply that his disaster must be in punishment of some secret sin, perhaps that hybris or insolent pride of prosperity, which particularly arouses the jealous anger of the gods. They assure him that evil is merely good in disguise, some part of the divine plan seen too narrowly by frail minds unconscious of the whole. Let Balta Achua keep faith and courage, and he will be rewarded in the end. Better still, his enemies will be punished. Balta Achua calls out to the gods for help, and the fragment suddenly ends. Another poem, found among the ruins of Ashurbanipal's collection of Babylonian literature, presents the same problem more definitely in the person of Tabi Utul Enlil, who appears to have been a ruler in Nippur. He describes his difficulties. My eyeballs he obscured, bolting them as with a lock. My ears he bolted like those of a deaf person. A king, I have been changed into a slave. As a madman, my companions maltreat me. Send me help from the pit dug for me. By day, deep sighs, at night weeping. The month, cries. The year, distress. He goes on to tell what a pious fellow he has always been, the very last man in the world who should have met with so cruel a fate. As though I had not always set aside the portion for the god, and had not invoked the goddess at the meal, had not bowed my face and brought my tribute, as though I were one in whose mouth supplication and prayer were not constant. I taught my country to guard the name of the god, to honor the name of the goddess I accustomed my people. I thought that such things were pleasing to a god. Stricken with disease, despite all this formal piety, he muses on the impossibility of understanding the gods, and on the uncertainty of human affairs. Who is there that can grasp the will of the gods in heaven? The plan of a god full of mystery? Who can understand it? He who was alive yesterday is dead today. In an instant he is cast into grief. Of a sudden he is crushed. For a moment he sings and plays. In a twinkling he wails like a mourner. Like a net trouble has covered me. My eyes look but see not. My ears are open but they hear not. Pollution has fallen upon my genitals, and it has assailed the glands in my bowels. With death grows dark my whole body. All day the pursuer pursues me. During the night he gives me no breath for a moment. My limbs are dismembered, they march out of unison. In my dung I pass the night like an ox, like a sheep. I mix in my excrements. Like Job, he makes another act of faith. But I know the day of the cessation of my tears, a day of the grace of the protecting spirits. Then divinity will be merciful. In the end, everything turns out happily. A spirit appears and cures all of Tabi's ailments. A mighty storm drives all the demons of disease out of his frame. He praises Marduk, offers rich sacrifice, and calls upon everyone never to despair of the gods. 
It is probable that this composition, prototypes of which are found in Sumeria, influenced the author of the book of Job. As there is but a step from this to the book of Job, so we find in late Babylonian literature unmistakable premonitions of Ecclesiastes. In the epic of Gilgamesh, the goddess Sabitu advises the hero to give up his longing for a life after death and to eat, drink, and be merry on the earth. O Gilgamesh, why dost thou run in all directions? The life that thou seekest thou wilt not find. When the gods created mankind, they determined death for mankind. Life they kept in their own hands. Thou, O Gilgamesh, fill thy belly. Day and night be thou merry. Day and night be joyous and content. Let thy garments be pure, thy head be washed. Wash thyself with water. Regard the little one who takes hold of thy hand. Enjoy the wife in thy bosom. Compare with Ecclesiastes. Chapter 9, verses 7 to 9. Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God now accepteth thy works. Let thy garments be always white, and let thy head lack no ointment. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity. In another tablet we hear a bitter note, culminating in atheism and blasphemy. Gubaru, a Babylonian Alcibiades, interrogates an elder skeptically. O very wise one, O possessor of intelligence, let thy heart groan. The heart of God is as far as the inner parts of the heavens. Wisdom is hard, and men do not understand it. To which the old man answers with the foreboding of Amos and Isaiah, Give attention, my friend, and understand my thought. Men exalt the work of the great man who is skilled in murder. They disparage the poor man who has done no sin. They justify the wicked man whose fault is grave. They drive away the just man who seeks the will of God. They let the strong take the food of the poor. They strengthen the mighty. They destroy the weak man. The rich man drives him away. He advises Gubaro to do the will of the gods nonetheless, but Gubaro will have nothing to do with gods or priests who are always on the side of the biggest fortunes. They have offered lies and untruth without ceasing. They say in noble words what is in favor of the rich man. Is his wealth diminished? They come to his help. They ill-treat the weak man like a thief. They destroy him in a tremor. They extinguish him like a flame. We must not exaggerate the prevalence of such moods in Babylon. Doubtless the people listened lovingly to their priests and crowded the temples to seek favors of the gods. The marvel is that they were so long loyal to a religion that offered them so little consolation. Nothing could be known, said the priests, except by divine revelation, and this revelation came only through the priests. The last chapter of that revelation told how the dead soul, whether good or bad, ascended into Aralu or Hades to spend there an eternity in darkness and suffering. Is it any wonder that Babylon gave itself to revelry, while Nebuchadrezzar, having all, understanding nothing, fearing everything, went mad? 10. Epitaph Tradition and the book of Daniel, unverified by any document known to us, tell how Nebuchadrezzar, after a long reign of uninterrupted victory and prosperity, after beautifying his city with roads and palaces and erecting fifty-four temples to the gods, fell into a strange insanity, thought himself a beast, walked on all fours, and ate grass. For four years his name disappears from the history and governmental records of Babylonia. It reappears for a moment, and then in 562 B.C. he passes away. Within thirty years after his death, his empire crumbled to pieces. Nabonidus, who held the throne for seventeen years, preferred archaeology to government and devoted himself to excavating the antiquities of Sumeria while his own realm was going to ruin. The army fell into disorder, businessmen forgot love of country and the sublime internationalism of finance, the people, busy with trade and pleasure, unlearned the arts of war. The priests usurped more and more of the royal power and fattened their treasuries with wealth that tempted invasion and conquest. When Cyrus and his disciplined Persians stood at the gates, the anti-clericals of Babylon connived to open the city to him and welcomed his enlightened domination. For two centuries Persia ruled Babylonia as part of the greatest empire that history had yet known. Then the exuberant Alexander came, captured the unresisting capital, conquered all the Near East, and drank himself to death in the palace of Nebuchadrezzar. The civilization of Babylonia was not as fruitful for humanity as Egypt's, not as varied and profound as India's, not as subtle and mature as China's. And yet it was from Babylonia that those fascinating legends came which, 
through the literary artistry of the Jews, became an inseparable portion of Europe's religious lore. It was from Babylonia rather than from Egypt that the roving Greeks brought to their city-states and thence to Rome and ourselves the foundations of mathematics, astronomy, medicine, grammar, lexicography, archaeology, history, and philosophy. The Greek names for the metals and the constellations, for weights and measures, for musical instruments and many drugs, are translations, sometimes mere transliterations of Babylonian names. While Greek architecture derived its forms and inspiration from Egypt and Crete, Babylonian architecture, through the ziggurat, led to the towers of Moslem mosques, the steeples and campaniles of medieval art, and the setback style of contemporary architecture in America. The laws of Hammurabi became for all ancient societies a legacy comparable to Rome's gift of order and government to the modern world. Through Assyria's conquest of Babylon, her appropriation of the ancient city's culture and her dissemination of that culture throughout her wide empire, through the long captivity of the Jews and the great influence upon them of Babylonian life and thought, through the Persian and Greek conquests, which opened with unprecedented fullness and freedom all the roads of communication and trade between Babylon and the rising cities of Ionia, Asia Minor, and Greece. Through these and many other ways, the civilization of the land between the rivers passed down into the cultural endowment of our race. In the end, nothing is lost. For good or evil, every event has effects forever. Chapter 10 Assyria 1. Chronicles Beginnings, Cities, Race, The Conquerors, Sennacherib and Esarhaddon, Sardanapalus. Meanwhile, three hundred miles north of Babylon, another civilization had appeared. Forced to maintain a hard military life by the mountain tribes always threatening it on every side, it had in time overcome its assailants, had conquered its parent cities in Elam, Sumeria, Akkad, and Babylonia, had mastered Phoenicia and Egypt, and had for two centuries dominated the Near East with brutal power. Sumeria was to Babylonia, and Babylonia to Assyria, what Crete was to Greece and Greece to Rome. The first created a civilization, the second developed it to its height, the third inherited it, added little to it, protected it, and transmitted it as a dying gift to the encompassing and victorious barbarians. For barbarism is always around civilization, amid it and beneath it, ready to engulf it by arms or mass migration or unchecked fertility. Barbarism is like the jungle. It never admits its defeat. It waits patiently for centuries to recover the territory it has lost. The new state grew about four cities fed by the waters or tributaries of the Tigris. Ashur, which is now at Kalat Shergat, Arbila, which is Irbil, Kalak, which is Nimrud, and Nineveh, which is Kuyunjik just across the river from Oily Mosul. At Ashur, prehistoric obsidian flakes and knives have been found, and black pottery with geometric patterns that suggest a Central Asian origin. At Tepe Gara, near the site of Nineveh, a recent expedition unearthed a town which its proud discoverers date back to 3700 B.C. Despite its many temples and tombs, its well-carved cylinder seals, its combs and jewelry, and the oldest dice known to history— a thought for reformers. The god Ashur gave his name to a city and finally to all Assyria. There the earliest of the nation's kings had their residence until its exposure to the heat of the desert and the attacks of the neighboring Babylonians led Ashur's rulers to build a secondary capital in cooler Nineveh, named also after a god, Nina, the Ishtar of Assyria. Here in the heyday of Ashurbanipal, 300,000 people lived and all the Western Orient came to pay tribute to the universal king. The population was a mixture of Semites from the civilized south, Babylonia and Akkadia, with non-Semitic tribes from the west, probably of Hittite or Mitannian affinity, and Kurdish mountaineers from the Caucasus. They took their common language and their arts from Sumeria, but modified them later into an almost indistinguishable similarity to the language and arts of Babylonia. Their circumstances, however, forbade them to indulge in the effeminate ease of Babylon. From beginning to end, they were a race of warriors, mighty in muscle and courage, abounding in proud hair and beard, standing straight, stern, and stolid in their monuments, and bestriding with tremendous feet the East Mediterranean world. Their history is one of kings and slaves, wars and conquests, 
bloody victories and sudden defeat. The early kings, once mere Patasus tributary to the south, took advantage of the Kassite domination of Babylonia to establish their independence, and soon enough one of them decked himself with that title which all the monarchs of Assyria were to display, King of Universal Reign. Out of the dull dynasties of these forgotten potentates, certain figures emerge whose deeds illuminate the development of their country. While Babylonia was still in the darkness of the Kassite era, Shalmaneser I brought the little city-states of the north under one rule and made Kalak his capital. But the first great name in Assyrian history is tiglath I. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. If it is wise to believe monarchs, he slew 120 lions on foot and 800 from his chariot. One of his inscriptions, written by a scribe more royalist than the king, tells how he hunted nations as well as animals. In my fierce valor I marched against the people of Kumu, conquered their cities, carried off their booty, their goods, and their property without reckoning, and burned their cities with fire, destroyed and devastated them. The people of Adanch left their mountains and embraced my feet. I imposed taxes upon them. In every direction he led his armies, conquering the Hittites, the Armenians, and forty other nations, capturing Babylon and frightening Egypt into sending him anxious gifts. He was particularly mollified by a crocodile. With the proceeds of his conquests, he built temples to the Assyrian gods and goddesses, who, like anxious debutantes, asked no questions about the source of his wealth. Then Babylon revolted, defeated his armies, pillaged his temples, and carried his gods into Babylonian captivity. tiglath pileser died of shame. His reign was a symbol and summary of all Assyrian history, death and taxes, first for Assyria's neighbors, then for herself. Ashurnasirpal II conquered a dozen petty states, brought much booty home from the wars, cut out with his own hand the eyes of princely captives, enjoyed his harem, and passed respectably away. Shalmaneser III carried these conquests as far as Damascus, fought costly battles, killing 16,000 Syrians in one engagement, built temples, levied tribute, and was deposed by his son in a violent revolution. Samuramat ruled as queen mother for three years and provided a frail historical basis, for this is all that we know of her, for the Greek legend of Semiramis, half-goddess and half-queen, great general, great engineer, and great statesman, so attractively detailed by Diodorus the Sicilian. tiglath the III gathered new armies, reconquered Armenia, overran Syria and Babylonia, made vassal cities of Damascus, Samaria, and Babylon, extended the rule of Assyria from the Caucasus to Egypt, tired of war, became an excellent administrator, built many temples and palaces, held his empire together with an iron hand, and died peacefully in bed. Sargon II, an officer in the army, made himself king by a Napoleonic coup d'etat, led his troops in person, and took in every engagement the most dangerous post, defeated Elam and Egypt, reconquered Babylonia, and received the homage of the Jews, the Philistines, and even of the Cypriot Greeks, ruled his empire well, encouraged arts and letters, handicrafts and trade, and died in a victorious battle that definitely preserved Assyria from invasion by the wild Cimmerian hordes. His son Sennacherib put down revolts in the distant provinces adjoining the Persian Gulf, attacked Jerusalem and Egypt without success, sacked 89 cities and 820 villages, captured 7,200 horses, 11,000 asses, 80,000 oxen, 800,000 sheep, and 208,000 prisoners. The official historian on his life did not understate these figures. Then, irritated by the prejudice of Babylon in favor of freedom, he besieged it, took it, and burned it to the ground. Nearly all the inhabitants, young and old, male and female, were put to death, so that mountains of corpses blocked the streets. The temples and palaces were pillaged to the last shekel, and the once omnipotent gods of Babylon were hacked to pieces or carried in bondage to Nineveh. Marduk, the god, became a menial to Ashur. Such Babylonians as survived did not conclude that Marduk had been overrated. They told themselves, as the captive Jews would tell themselves a century later in that same Babylon, that their god had condescended to be defeated in order to punish his people. With the spoils of his conquests and pillage, Sennacherib rebuilt Nineveh, changed the course of rivers to protect it, reclaimed waste lands with the vigor of countries suffering from an agricultural surplus, and was assassinated by his sons while piously mumbling his prayers.
Another son, Esarhaddon, snatched the throne from his blood-stained brothers, invaded Egypt to punish her for supporting Syrian revolts, made her an Assyrian province, amazed Western Asia with his long triumphal progress from Memphis to Nineveh, dragging endless booty in his train, established Assyria in unprecedented prosperity as master of the whole Near Eastern world, delighted Babylonia by freeing and honoring its captive gods and rebuilding its shattered capital, conciliated Elam by feeding its famine-stricken people in an act of international beneficence almost without parallel in the ancient world, and died on the way to suppress a revolt in Egypt after giving his empire the justest and kindliest rule in its half-barbarous history. His successor, Ashurbanipal, the Sardanapalus of the Greeks, reaped the fruits of Esarhaddon's sowing. During his long reign, Assyria reached the climax of its wealth and prestige. After him, his country, ruined by forty years of intermittent war, fell into exhaustion and decay, and ended its career hardly a decade after Ashurbanipal's death. A scribe has preserved to us a yearly record of this reign. It is a dull and bloody mess of war after war, siege after siege, starved cities and flayed captives. The scribe represents Ashurbanipal himself as reporting his destruction of Elam. For a distance of one month and twenty-five days' march, I devastated the districts of Elam. I spread salt and thornbush there to injure the soil. Sons of the kings, sisters of the kings, members of Elam's royal family, young and old, prefects, governors, knights, artisans, as many as there were inhabitants, male and female, big and little, horses, mules, asses, flocks and herds, more numerous than a swarm of locusts, I carried them off as booty to Assyria. The dust of Susa, of Madaktu, of Haltemash and of their other cities, I carried it off to Assyria. In a month of days I subdued Elam in its whole extent. The voice of man, the steps of flocks and herds, the happy shouts of mirth, I put an end to them in its fields, which I left for the asses, the gazelles, and all manner of wild beasts to people. The severed head of the Elamite king was brought to Ashurbanipal as he feasted with his queen in the palace garden. He had the head raised on a pole in the midst of his guests, and the royal revel went on. Later, the head was fixed over the gate of Nineveh and slowly rotted away. The Elamite general, Dananu, was flayed alive and then was bled like a lamb. His brother had his throat cut and his body was divided into pieces which were distributed over the country as souvenirs. It never occurred to Ashurbanipal that he and his men were brutal. These clean-cut penalties were surgical necessities in his attempt to remove rebellions and establish discipline among the heterogeneous and turbulent peoples from Ethiopia to Armenia and from Syria to Media, whom his predecessors had subjected to Assyrian rule. It was his obligation to maintain this legacy intact. He boasted of the peace that he had established in his empire and of the good order that prevailed in its cities, and the boast was not without truth. That he was not merely a conqueror intoxicated with blood, he proved by his munificence as a builder and as a patron of letters and the arts. Like some Roman ruler calling to the Greeks, he sent to all his dominions for sculptors and architects to design and adorn new temples and palaces. He commissioned innumerable scribes to secure and copy for him all the classics of Sumerian and Babylonian literature, and gathered these copies in his library at Nineveh, where modern scholarship found them almost intact after twenty-five centuries of time had flowed over them. Like another Frederick, he was as vain of his literary abilities as of his triumphs in war and the chase. Diodorus describes him as a dissolute and bisexual Nero, but in the wealth of documents that have come down to us from this period, there is little corroboration for this view. From the composition of literary tablets, Ashurbanipal passed with royal confidence, armed with only a knife and javelin, to hand-to-hand -hand encounters with lions. If we may credit the reports of his contemporaries, he did not hesitate to lead the attack in person, and often dealt with his own hand the decisive blow. Little wonder that Byron was fascinated with him, and wove about him a drama, half legend and half history, in which all the wealth and power of Assyria came to their height, and broke into universal ruin and royal despair. 2. Assyrian Government Imperialism, Assyrian War, the Conscript Gods, Law, Delicacies of Penology, Administration, the Violence of Oriental Monarchies. If we should admit the imperial principle, that it is good for the sake of spreading law, security, commerce, and peace, that many states should be brought by persuasion or force under the authority of one government, then we should have to concede to Assyria the distinction of having established in Western Asia a larger measure and area of order and prosperity than that region of the earth had ever, to our knowledge, enjoyed before. 
The government of Ashurbanipal, which ruled Assyria, Babylonia, Armenia, Media, Palestine, Syria, Phoenicia, Sumeria, Elam, and Egypt, was without doubt the most extensive administrative organization yet seen in the Mediterranean or Near Eastern world. Only Hammurabi and Tutmos III had approached it, and Persia alone would equal it before the coming of Alexander. In some ways, it was a liberal empire. Its larger cities retained considerable local autonomy, and each nation in it was left its own religion, law, and ruler, provided it paid its tribute promptly. In so loose an organization, every weakening of the central power was bound to produce rebellions, or at the best a certain tributary negligence, so that the subject states had to be conquered again and again. To avoid these recurrent rebellions, tiglath the III established the characteristic Assyrian policy of deporting conquered populations to alien habitats where, mingling with the natives, they might lose their unity and identity and have less opportunity to rebel. Revolts came nevertheless, and Assyria had to keep herself always ready for war. The army was therefore the most vital part of the government. Assyria recognized frankly that government is the nationalization of force, and her chief contributions to progress were in the art of war. Chariots, cavalry, infantry, and sappers were organized into flexible formations. Siege mechanisms were as highly developed as among the Romans. Strategy and tactics were well understood. Tactics centered about the idea of rapid movement making possible a piecemeal attack. So old is the secret of Napoleon. Ironworking had grown to the point of encasing the warrior with armor to a degree of stiffness rivaling a medieval knight. Even the archers and pikemen wore copper or iron helmets, padded loincloths, enormous shields, and a leather skirt covered with metal scales. The weapons were arrows, lances, cutlasses, maces, clubs, slings, and battle axes. The nobility fought from chariots in the van of the battle, and the king in his royal chariot usually led them in person. Generals had not yet learned to die in bed. Asher Nasserpal introduced the use of cavalry as an aid to the chariots, and this innovation proved decisive in many engagements. The principal siege engine was a battering ram tipped with iron. Sometimes it was suspended from a scaffold by ropes and was swung back to give it forward impetus. Sometimes it was run forward on wheels. The besieged fought from the walls with missiles, torches, burning pitch, chains designed to entangle the ram, and gaseous stink-pots, as they were called, to befuddle the enemy. Again, the novel is not new. A captured city was usually plundered and burnt to the ground, and its site was deliberately denuded by killing its trees. The loyalty of the troops was secured by dividing a large part of the spoils among them. Their bravery was ensured by the general rule of the Near East that all captives in war might be enslaved or slain. Soldiers were rewarded for every severed head they brought in from the field, so that the aftermath of a victory generally witnessed the wholesale decapitation of fallen foes. Most often the prisoners, who would have consumed much food in a long campaign and would have constituted a danger and nuisance in the rear, were dispatched after the battle. They knelt with their backs to their captors, who beat their heads in with clubs or cut them off with cutlasses. Scribes stood by to count the number of prisoners taken and killed by each soldier and apportioned the booty accordingly. The king, if time permitted, presided at the slaughter. The nobles among the defeated were given more special treatment. Their ears, noses, hands, and feet were sliced off, or they were thrown from high towers, or they and their children were beheaded or flayed alive or roasted over a slow fire. No compunction seems to have been felt at this waste of human life. The birth rate would soon make up for it, and meanwhile it relieved the pressure of population upon the means of subsistence. Probably it was in part by their reputation for mercy to prisoners of war that Alexander and Caesar undermined the morale of the enemy and conquered the Mediterranean world. Next to the army, the chief reliance of the monarch was upon the church, and he paid lavishly for the support of the priests. The formal head of the state was, by concerted fiction, the god Ashur. All pronouncements were in his name, all laws were edicts of his divine will, all taxes were collected for his treasury, all campaigns were fought to furnish him, or occasionally another deity, with spoils and glory. The king had himself described as a god, usually an incarnation of Shamash, the sun. The religion of Assyria, like its language, its science, and its arts, was imported from Sumeria and Babylonia, with occasional adaptations to the needs of a military state. The adaptation was most visible in the case of the law, which was distinguished by a martial ruthlessness. 
Punishment ranged from public exhibition to forced labor, twenty to a hundred lashes, the slitting of nose and ears, castration, pulling out the tongue, gouging out the eyes, impalement, and beheading. The laws of Sargon II prescribe such additional delicacies as the drinking of poison and the burning of the offender's son or daughter alive on the altar of the god. But there is no evidence of these laws being carried out in the last millennium before Christ. Adultery, rape, and some forms of theft were considered capital crimes. Trial by ordeal was occasionally employed. The accused, sometimes bound in fetters, was flung into the river, and his guilt was left to the arbitrament of the water. In general, Assyrian law was less secular and more primitive than the Babylonian Code of Hammurabi, which apparently preceded it in time. The oldest extant Assyrian laws are ninety articles contained on three tablets found at Ashur and dating circa 1300 B.C. Local administration, originally by feudal barons, fell in the course of time into the hands of provincial prefects or governors appointed by the king. This form of imperial government was taken over by Persia and passed on from Persia to Rome. The prefects were expected to collect taxes, to organize the corvée for works which, like irrigation, could not be left to personal initiative, and above all to raise regiments and lead them in the royal campaigns. Meanwhile, royal spies, or as we should say intelligence officers, kept watch on these prefects and their aides and informed the king concerning the state of the nation. All in all, the Assyrian government was primarily an instrument of war, for war was often more profitable than peace. It cemented discipline, intensified patriotism, strengthened the royal power, and brought abundant spoils and slaves for the enrichment and service of the capital. Hence, Assyrian history is largely a picture of cities sacked and villages or fields laid waste. When Ashurbanipal suppressed the revolt of his brother, Shamash Shum Ukin, and captured Babylon after a long and bitter siege, the city presented a terrible spectacle and shocked even the Assyrians. Most of the numerous victims to pestilence or famine lay about the streets or in the public squares, a prey to the dogs and swine. Such of the inhabitants and the soldiery as were comparatively strong had endeavored to escape into the country, and only those remained who had not sufficient strength to drag themselves beyond the walls. Ashurbanipal pursued the fugitives, and having captured nearly all of them, vented on them the full fury of his vengeance. He caused the tongues of the soldiers to be torn out, and then had them clubbed to death. He massacred the common folk in front of the great winged bulls which had already witnessed a similar butchery half a century before under his grandfather Sennacherib. The corpses of the victims remained long unburied, a prey to all unclean beasts and birds. The weakness of Oriental monarchies was bound up with this addiction to violence. Not only did the subject provinces repeatedly revolt, but within the royal palace or family itself, violence again and again attempted to upset what violence had established and maintained. At or near the end of almost every reign, some disturbance broke out over the succession to the throne. The aging monarch saw conspiracies forming around him, and in several cases he was hastened to his end by murder. The nations of the Near East preferred violent uprisings to corrupt elections, and their form of recall was assassination. Some of these wars were doubtless inevitable, Barbarians prowled about every frontier, and one reign of weakness would see the Scythians, the Sumerians, or some other horde sweeping down upon the wealth of the Assyrian cities. And perhaps we exaggerate the frequency of war and violence in these Oriental states through the accident that ancient monuments and modern chroniclers have preserved the dramatic record of battles and ignored the victories of peace. Historians have been prejudiced in favor of bloodshed. They found it, or thought their readers would find it, more interesting than the quiet achievements of the mind. We think war less frequent today because we are conscious of the lucid intervals of peace, while history seems conscious only of the fevered crises of war. 3. Assyrian life, industry and trade, marriage and morals, religion and science, letters and libraries, the Assyrian ideal of a gentleman. The economic life of Assyria did not differ much from that of Babylonia, for in many ways the two countries were merely the north and south of one civilization. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.